Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this month's edition of Healthcare Hangouts. And tonight we have an interesting topic of Google Healthcare Helpouts. Should physicians participate? And my guest tonight is Brian Pollock, who is one of the early adopters of Google Helpouts, which is like Hangouts, but different. So we're going to talk today with Brian and find out what experience he's been having with being one of the first physicians to offer help out services and how he's been dealing with the HIPAA compliance issues and what kind of things the patients have been asking for and just generally what his impression is of healthcare help outs. So Brian, welcome. Thank you. It's Brian, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Okay. I am an internal medicine physician and uh, I'm practicing in Pennsylvania. Um, born in Pennsylvania, medical school in Pennsylvania, residency in Pennsylvania. And uh, I did a year of geriatrics fellowship out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, just to mix it up a little bit. And then came back to Pennsylvania because this is where family is. Um, I work in a large healthcare system where we have residents. And so his, when I first started working, half of my time was spent seeing my own patients. The other half of the time was spent working with residents in some sort of teaching capacity. And uh, I, I'm kind of blessed because the healthcare system that I work in really does support that kind of curiosity and, and, and uh, experimentation and trying new things. I, I like it because we are small enough that one person can make a difference, but big enough that the difference that you make can really impact a lot of, a lot of change, a lot of lives. And so it's, it's a, a very good environment. So is that where your motivation was to be one of the first physicians to try out the help outs? As a matter of fact, it is. You know, when I first saw uh, Google announcing that help outs were, were coming around, I thought this is going to be useful. That was my first impression. Uh, I, I never did jump on the Twitter bandwagon, and much of it was because it just seems like it's just noise that's going out there, a bunch of people talking at a bunch of other people. And I, I wanted something where someone who has a question could go into a social network environment and find someone who could help answer that question. Um, it, it, it just... It, it seems that with how computers can network us these days that it's very unfortunate that it's hard for us to really connect on an individual basis from, you know, from people who have a need to those who can fulfill that need. And so when Help Outs was announced, I thought, this is going to be interesting. And I threw my name into the hat like probably hundreds or thousands of other people did. And uh, Google picked my number and they, they said, um, you know, make the listing, and they gave you some guidance on making the listing. And I started to think, so what am I putting a listing up for? Who's my audience? What do I want out of this? And the primary thing that I want is I want to know what patients want to know. I want to know for the people who would use a help out for medical purposes, what kind of questions do they have? Why are they coming to help outs for this? Um, in my listing, I also say that I'm available for other providers. That if providers, I like data, and and I work a lot of quality improvement projects uh, with our with our healthcare system, and I'm also curious to see, especially in this meaningful use world, in this pay for performance world, in this accountable care organization world, um, what other providers want to know. Uh, uh, what what they're doing, what kinds of help they need to help quality improvement projects come along, um, and so that's what what I thought was what do I want to get out get out of this is I want to see what other questions what questions other people have why would they come to this venue to get some answers so that's what motivated me to set up the the listing in the first place. Brian, I'm sharing with the viewing audience now your page on Google Helpouts and. Um, those of you who are looking at this, he has a nice background and a picture that matches his Google Plus profile. In this case, he has chosen not to charge for his services. Some of the physicians 
are charging a per minute, some are charging a per 15 minute basis, and there are several that are um, free right now just to try it out and figure out what it is they're, they're needed for. Uh, it tells about um, Brian, gives a, a little bio, and describes what kind of services he offers. So, and it also uh, says that he's board certified. It gives his credentials, and then people have the ability to rate him. Now, I'm going to come back and uh, get back into our Hangout here. Let's see if I can very quickly. There we go. Okay, so um, what I'd like to know, Brian, is before Helpouts came out, were you using Hangouts as um, in your your medical practice at any? Do you have any experience with Hangouts before Helpouts? Uh, I've used Hangouts just for communicating with friends, and aside from friends showing me rashes on Hangouts, no, I've not used it for any other medical purposes. So you um, went straight from nothing to Helpouts. Right. Now, we, we have toyed with the idea of e-visits back at our healthcare system, and one of the other docs that I actually share a room with had been experimenting with e-visits just in a very controlled setting, and that was in a very formal setting also. That was in the context of if we were to bill insurance, what would that look like? Um, and so, and, and the definition of e-visit was much more broad than a video synchronous communication. So um, secure messaging was, was counted as an e-visit also. Um, and so they were doing it just as a pilot to see how could this work. And so the, the concept itself is not foreign. But um, yeah, I'd never, I'd never done video chats for medical purposes before this. So now that you've set yourself up as a help out, what is the word they call it? Is it a help out expert or a help out advisor? They refer to it as providers. And so whether you're, whether you're doing medical uh, help outs, you are a provider. If you're doing IT help outs, you're a provider. If you're given the free guitar lessons, you're a help out provider. Wonderful. So now that you're out there, and people can find you. And by the way, for those of you who have not done a lot of diving into help outs, it's really cool how accessible help out providers are because there's a phone app. And on that phone app, it's basically a directory by category. And there's a category of health. And within health, there's everything from fitness instructors to physicians. And Brian is one of the listings there. And the the application, the phone app, is really very easy to navigate and you can make appointments from there, you can even have your hangout from there, or I should say help out from there. So n now that you're out there, Brian, what kind of information have you, what kind of help have you been giving and what have people been asking for? Yeah, the, the spectrum of what people have wanted to know has been a bit broad. Um, some people just want to know what it's like to do help outs. Uh, one of my first help outs was with a young man who uh, was who did his medical training in another country and he wanted to know how to get into a residency program. He had moved to America and was trying to do research and externships and to stay medically relevant while he looked for a residency position. And so that was his question was how do I get into a residency? Uh, most of the help outs that I've done have been very medical uh, medically oriented, and um, the folks that will come that will come through. One gentleman had diabetes, and he was describing his his labs. He was describing his medicines that he's on, um, and his his main question was, "Am I on track?" It was almost like a second a second consult or like a second opinion. And he just wanted to make sure that the medicines and things made sense. Um, another person had a cough that had been going on for a couple of months, and they described the the sequence of tests that they had gone through to look into this cough. And again, it, I, I felt like my role in that one was to reassure them that it sounds like the things that your providers are doing, that your doctors are doing, are perfectly appropriate. It sounds like they're going through a logical step uh, of things. Um, it's probably worth explicitly noting that, like you showed on the on the listing that I have, uh, I am not here to order tests for people. I am not here to order pills for people. I'm here to talk to folks and help them to understand how the how the um, how doctors think and how the healthcare system works when it works. Uh, for example, one of the people who logged on 
Um, here's what I do see a fair amount of, is people who do not have insurance, and they have some sort of a symptom or constellation of symptoms, and they are not sure if this warrants plopping down tens or a couple hundred dollars, heaven forbid there's testing that follows, should I go and see a doctor and, and get this worked up? And I've had a few help outs that, that are along that line. Um, but for example, one of the people who did not have insurance had some vague symptoms. They had been going on for a while. And uh, it, it was interesting because he starts talking about the things that he and family members have been looking up online to see what his symptoms might be, uh, 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 what the diagnosis might be. And um, my, my, what I was able to do to help him out was I explained that when a person comes in to see a doctor, that the doctor starts to form a differential diagnosis. And for folks who are not medically inclined with that, when, we have, when you have a diagnosis, that's great. You have something to treat. You've got tests that say, here's what your problem is. But until you can really arrive to a single diagnosis, you're coming in with symptoms and signs and tests. And they might suggest uh, uh, several different things that could be causing your problem, several different possible diagnoses. And that list of possible diagnoses is what we call a differential diagnosis. And that's what I was explaining to this gentleman, was that when he, if, if it's going to come to the point where he's going to go and see someone formally for, for you know, medical attention, uh, that I cautioned him to not come in with a list of possible diagnoses. I said the best thing that you can do is uh, keep a diary of what you're feeling, what makes it better, what makes it worse, what other associated symptoms do you feel when this primary issue comes on. And the number of times that I, in the office where I've seen and it's usually a young male who comes in and says something like, I think I have appendicitis. And they're pointing completely to the wrong part of their belly that's nowhere near the appendix. And, uh, and the point is that people come in very often with a preconceived idea. And if you go to the doctor and you say, I think I have appendicitis, then the doctor very often is thinking, my job is either to confirm or refute the diagnosis of appendicitis. And so especially when I have someone with some vague symptoms, like this gentleman with the help out, uh, his, if he went in saying, I think I have Lyme disease, you're going to lose him right there. That, that the doctor's going to think, well, my job is to either confirm or refute the diagnosis of Lyme disease. I'll order a Lyme test, whether it's appropriate or not. And it's going to come back positive or negative, and we'll treat along that way. Um, and so I, I kind of encouraged him to say, if you go in just, that was the first thing, was just get a list of the symptoms, uh, uh, kind of a description of what you've been feeling and how long it's been going on. Um, the second part that uh, I encouraged him to do was to establish with someone whom, whom he can carry a relationship with. Uh, with the idea that you've got some vague symptoms and they're not going to be able to solve it on day one. You need to be able to see someone on a longitudinal basis, someone that you can trust, someone that you feel that you can talk to, and that, that they're listening to you. Because it might take time to really ferret out a diagnosis. And so, uh, and uh, the other part, if, if, if I may monopolize, the other part that goes along this is there's a lot of folks out there with um, psych complaints, a lot of psychi psychiatric complaints. Uh, I've had a fair amount of attention deficit and one of the tough parts with attention deficit, if you know folks who have experienced this condition, um, it can be hard to tease out attention deficit from things like anxiety or depression. And I, that's a lot of what I've seen also, where someone's been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and they feel like their medicines aren't really helping them out. And they're wondering why. And they want to jump ship. They want to change to a new doctor. And I encourage them to and I even do this in real life, I encourage people to stay with your doctor, describe what you're feeling, make sure that you're being heard, and, and look for other kinds of problems that might be complicating the picture. So that's, that's been a lot of the uh, help outs. When I hear you describing some of the, the questions that you addressed and some of the guidance you gave, 
my mind is immediately going to the benefit of even a system, a health system that would put somebody in place to you were really sort of acting as not really triage, but you were you were wearing a lot of different hats and and a lot of those doctors who end up with those patients who are better informed and better advised really owe you a thank you and to have someone like that intentionally put in place in a health system I would think would be really beneficial to cut down on the wasted time and um, unnecessary tests and, and everything else that would otherwise follow. I, I do get the feeling that from the patient perspective, and I can understand this easily, that if they've been seeing a doc and the doc's not able to get a diagnosis or find the right combination of therapeutic interventions that really help them to feel good, that they want to leave and find someone else. And, and there's value to that, I'm sure. But, uh, boy, to start up with someone new and, and try to rehash the whole story and go through the same list of medicines that you just tried over the previous couple of years, it's... it's you're probably doing more of a disservice by jumping ship than, than to really make sure that you're being heard. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to get to uh, a really meaty question here because I'm hoping that we have time. We're going to open up the floor. We have a, a viewer, that uh, a physician, who would like to be in on the conversation. I would very much like her to pull her in and have her ask some questions of her own. But before we do that, let's talk HIPAA. Let's talk about limitations. You've already mentioned that you're, you're not there to be an online provider. This is not telemedicine in completion. This is really giving second opinions, giving advice, um, and, and really aiding to whatever the primary caregiver is going to be doing. So what about HIPAA? What about privacy? Are there things... First of all, how does Google handle it? I know that I, I posted on the event page, if people look, that I've linked to the fact that Google is willing to enter or is requires entering into a business associate uh, agreement with physicians who are going to be presenting themselves in a medical capacity. Um, but what does that really mean to you, Brian? How how has that really come to fruition for you? What does it? How does it look? So when I'm setting up my listing, uh, they do ask if you will be using Helpouts as a covered entity. I believe the language is. And uh, so they are they're very clearly aware of what, of what you know, the HIPAA restrictions require uh, on a very basic level from the HIPAA sake. Um, you cannot record a medical help out. That recording is simply disabled. Um, and honestly, beyond that, I, I can only assume that they're using some sort of security some sort of HIPAA compliant security with with servers and transmitting images, but uh, aside from that, I, aside from when I go in to set up my listing, saying that yes, I'm using uh, Google as a covered entity, I don't see anything else on my end. Well, I think I think it's important to note that you can choose when you when you sign up for help outs you can choose whether or not you consider yourself a covered entity whether or not you're going to be working in some healthcare capacity and google does leave that up to this the provider who's signing up to decide yes. that so if a physician wants to come in and they don't check that box and they're exchanging health information through the help outs they've opened themselves up to that liability. That's not Google's responsibility to say, oh, you should have done this, right? As a matter of fact, when I first set up my help out, I was thinking, I'm not going to be talking with people about their medical conditions. I'm going to be talking to them about you know, navigating the healthcare system. And, uh, but boy, early on, <laughs> you, you, you start looking at someone in the face and they start to go, okay, well, about three weeks ago, I had this skiing accident and now look at my finger and it's not straight and should I go see someone about that and so pretty quickly you realize that yes that's what patients want to talk about that's what people who are looking at the medical help outs want to talk about is their health and so I went back I edited my listing and I said yes that uh, I, I need the HIPAA coverage with that and when I originally started digging into what they were requiring and what they were offering with help outs in regards to health care. I originally remember reading something that said that you can only practice in the state where you're licensed. I can't find that anymore. Has that changed or am I just not digging in the same places? It's been a, it's been a couple weeks since I took a look at the guts of my listing. Um, 
but there, well, I know when I was going back to do the HIPAA part, that yes, there was still which do you want to limit your help outs to a certain state? Um, and again, since since I'm not prescribing, since I'm not ordering tests, that uh, I'm operating more under my MD degree rather than my medical license. And so, since my license is staying out of this, I um, I, I said no, I'm not going to limit my, limit myself to the state. Um, yeah, I can take a look at the listing now and see if you like. Yeah, I know that this is always evolving, so I, I want to caution the viewers that whatever we're talking about here today might change tomorrow, and uh, it seems to be evolving in the right direction, and I don't know how many additional doctors have signed up for help outs, but um, I'm hoping that as we get some people from our community to sign up that we can hear from them as well and, and help shape the way help outs um, look for the healthcare community, physicians and, and others. So. Yeah, right. Right now, the help out listing is simply asking where are you licensed to practice? And then, does the service provided in this help out listing need to be restricted to the region where you are licensed? Okay. And so that's it, that's too. Okay. Well, at this point, I would like to introduce our uh, viewer who is joining us, who is um, also a primary care physician, and it is Kathy. Kathy, say hello. She's going to unmute herself. Yeah, got to do that first. Hello. <laughs> and and it, I always mispronounce your name because the I is in front of the E. It's Kathy Nader, right? Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, and Kathy is in, am I allowed to say where? Oh, sure. Okay, in Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. And um, she was interested in joining because she's been asking some questions about help outs. And so I would like to pull you into the conversation at this point and ask if you have any questions for Brian that you would like to throw at him right now. Well, the first interesting thing is I can't find you on help outs, which makes me wonder if you are somehow restricted in terms of where you are. Hmm. Well, and that's interesting you say that because I originally saw him in his original listing before he edited, and I also did not see him on the page of options until I specifically plugged in his name. And I don't know if that's because it has limited my viewing by my location. I put just last name in, and I got a fashion designer named Sarah Pollock, but I didn't get Brian Pollock. So I don't know that. I don't think that my last name is, is tied to the listing. You know what? I wonder if I put a C in there. Well, I did. When I searched for you, Brian, I went into the health category, and then I searched Brian Pollock, P-O-L-L-A-K, yes. and you did come up at that point. But when I started perusing the listings, you, you weren't in the first page or two, and I didn't know if that was because it was searching or sorting by my location. Hmm. I know that when you do a search, or at least if you browse the sections, that you can, uh, I forget what it, you can, uh, there's a browse, you can order it by, one of them is by reputation, I think another one might just simply be alphabetic, but. Uh, I, I misspelled it, I found it. What if you just go straight to, if you browse instead, if you just go to health and browse all in health? Well, I did find it. Okay. So, so what were you what were you thinking about using help outs for, Kathy? Um, I'm would be more interested in doing it the way that what's it one medical is doing it, which would be specific to my patients and more of a, as a um, sort of another way that patients can reach me because I think there are a lot of patients with simple problems like a rash or a first time UTI that really would prefer to be able to talk to me that way rather than having to make the phone call, wait on the phone, make the appointment, you know, the whole nine yards for something that's very simple. I think um, employers would like that approach too because um, if, if you're doing this during regular business hours then why should a person have to leave bit, leave work for a couple hours, if not half a day, to come in for a simple bladder infection or to take a look at a rash, when they could just 
you know, some, pop into somewhere that has some secure uh, messaging, a camera, and you know, 15, 20 minutes later, they could be back, back out working. Yeah, but this would be specific just to the pa not new patients, but patients that I already have that I already patient. know. And I think that's important to note too that you have the ability to establish a criteria for which people can get help because um, is it One Health Group? Is that the name of the organization that's in there right now? I think and it's One Medical. One, one Medical Group, that's right. And they have one for different states and they say that if you're within their system and you're in their state, you can get help from them. But you can't, just anybody can't reach in and, and jump into a hangout or help out with them. How many of these have you done, Brian? Uh, it's about 20 of them. So, man, how long, when did you start? Uh, how long has Help Out been around? Is that a uh, couple months? A few months. So you yeah, started right October, away. October, October, the, the app, I found the app in October. Okay. And, the, and the app is not available on the iPhone. I thought that was interesting. Oh, interesting. I have also not done any advertising. I, I've not really, you know, I don't tweet anything, I don't post anything to any other social networks. These are just folks who have stumbled upon the, the listing. Gotcha through stumbled on, yeah. <laughs> How did you get the reviews that you got? Did you, did people just love what you had to say and next thing you knew that the next day you had a review racked up under your name? That's, uh, yeah. I don't do the uh, car salesman thing. No offense to any car salesman, but you know, is there anything that I've done that could make sure that you mark that we gave you excellent service today? Um, no, I just I just talk with folks, and whatever they review, they review. Uh, I've been also lucky that I know in the Google Helpouts community that there have been a lot of talk of people uh, getting hit by what they're calling the one star bandits, and these are folks who take advantage of a free help out come on, just simply mess around. They have no they have no intent to actually, you know, partake in any of the help at all. They just come in, mess around with people, and then end the help out and leave one star. Uh, I, I thought for sure that being a medical help out that someone would come on and, and just try to string me along with some sort of a crazy uh, symptom, uh, but I, I've not seen any jokester kind of activity, no pranks coming through. But, um, there yeah, are trolls about, everywhere. Yeah. Well, uh, I wouldn't have even thought about that. Yeah. Only about half the people who do help out seem to leave some sort of a review. Do they? I would assume that everyone is offered the opportunity. From what I've seen, yes, that's exactly it. The help out session ends, and then even the the client is posed with a feedback. <laughs> Pick a feedback frame right there as soon as the help out session ends. Do you have the ability to respond to poor feedback? No, and that's been one of the things that people in the help out community have been asking for is whether they would have a chance to, you know, remove help outs or uh, remove feedback on a help out that was a one star bandit or that the help out would have to last a certain number of minutes before the person was posed with the option of leaving feedback, which, which probably sounds like a better option. Um, but I've not heard anything from the folks at Google as far as any kind of updates about how feedback will be, will be handled in the future. But that's, that's one of the big issues that a lot of providers are having. Well, Kathy, is your organization an ACO? No. Okay. Because this is another area that I've wondered if this will be particularly attractive to a system to put something in place to manage patients and, and continue following up after they leave the hospital or giving them a way to get answers to manage them in large groups as opposed to having to go get an appointment and see somebody in order to get every question answered. What, what, what made you think to... Uh, consider help outs. Was there a particular situation or or need that has driven you in this direction? Yeah, well, my practice is sort of, you know, middle class people who I think it's very, sometimes for simple things, hard for them to get away from work. And I, and I offer one evening a week. But I thought, how can, how can I help them 
get to me in a more convenient fashion. So uh, telemedicine, of course, is the is the uh, thing that people talk about these days. And then I saw when I saw help outs come out, and I think you actually maybe brought it to my attention. I suspect. Yeah, and I we thought, oh, this looks like yeah, like something that would fill that need. Yeah, I think that we're onto something here if they can um, get it shaped in a way that it can really work. And I'm I'm looking forward to when they open the doors to having it be used by organizations, not just individuals. That's also where I think that the real potential is with this. Um, the the uh, the the medical one, the one medical group, uh, I, I think has a good model for doing this because. Uh, you can really help to triage folks. One of the big issues that we have in our healthcare system, which I'm sure is not unique, is overutilization of the emergency department for non-emergent things. And uh, if you had some clinical folks who were uh, available and you could do a quick video chat with your phone and say, hey, I'm having this kind of a problem, uh, here's what something looks like, and and then that person could help get you to an appropriate level of care rather than uh, gumming up the emergency department with, with more weight. Yeah, what I find with those phone calls that you know, a lot of the insurers have help, nurse help lines, and it seems right. like they're constantly being sent to the ER. It's just, oh, well, uh, yeah, you better go to the ER. I get the feeling that those nurse help lines are also following uh, rather strict um, algorithms. algorithms. Yeah, and it, I, it, it probably, you know, cuts uh, the top, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 percent where you say these are safe things that they can wait until the next morning. Um, then there's a middle, it seems like there's a middle ground where the nursing um, staff will call the provider, the doctor who's on call, and then the doc gets back to them and with some other kinds of um, some other kinds of options, but uh, it, it just seems like there's so much opportunity where you're just going to be, you're going to fear the liability, where you're going to say, I'm not going to leave this person sit overnight, and uh, I'm just afraid that what if this is the one person where something bad happens, just go to the emergency department, let someone take a look at you. And so if there's, if there's an option, if there's an alternative, then, um, then this would be a good alternative. I even thought this would be nice, you know, for for folks like us when we're on call. That uh, to, if I saw that my doc was on call and it says available now, then I could just go in that way to, um, to talk to the doctor to, to run an on-call question past them rather than calling the call service and um, waiting for that phone call back. I agree. That would be, that would be kind of terrific. And I know the patients would appreciate it. It's a patient-centered way of communicating. Mm -hmm. So do you have a, a list, a wish list, Brian, that you've put together of things that you wish you could do or wish that you could do differently with the help outs that you're waiting to see if they're listening? Um, I'm trying to think what would make it better. Uh, you know, my we, we've touched base on the big wish list items that that it could help with triaging those after hour calls or handling the acute the acute visit type issues um, things that we often try to do over the phone where uh, a video connection would be a little more personal touch and give you a little bit better feel that you're doing the right thing uh, one very technical aspect one of the folks that I was talking to was able to pull up his medical record on his computer and uh, through a patient portal and he's trying to describe to me what he's seeing on his screen and for some reason the screen sharing is disabled uh, I don't know if that's all, it's probably not all help outs but at the very least on medical help outs it's disabled Was that before or after you changed your agreement? Your that staff? was after Oh. And uh, I, I, yeah, and I, I I'm trying to remember if it was enabled before because I just like to see what's what's available. I don't think it was any different before changing versus after. Um, but that was one of the feature requests that I put in was to enable screen sharing. 
uh, if patients are going to have more transparency, they have access to their record. If they can share that directly with me, then I can take a quick look at the labs. Because what he had to do was he had to type all of his lab values into the um, into little chat sidebar, and so that was how I looked over some of the labs that he had. Um, one of the other things that I would love to see with help outs is uh, some way to truly limit it by age group. Um, I had seen many of the help out providers talking about uh, unexpected um, help outs with minors. And so in the help out community, there was th this came up and they were wondering how to handle that kind of situation. And likewise, uh, especially talking about medical issues, I don't want to be talking with a minor about things unless a parent is uh, actively involved in the help outs. As a matter of fact, I, I'm internal medicine trained, and so in general, 16 and over, 18 and over is, is where my medical knowledge starts. So it's true pediatric things. Maybe that's something Kathy can take care of. Um, I want to do a shout out real quick as we're having this conversation because we were hoping to have another viewer guest join us, Peter Kim, and he's um, sending a message out saying that he's not able to load the Hangout app right now. So Peter, if you're listening, I am also chatting with you on the other computer, so if you have any questions while we're having this conversation, go ahead and submit it and I'll ask on your behalf. So I'm um, sorry to interrupt the conversation because we're having such a good conversation, but I didn't want Peter to miss out on being able to ask some questions since he showed an interest. So um, let's, let's get into um, where help outs could go. We talked a little bit about where you see help outs can benefit in the future, Brian, and, and Kathy, you're obviously seeing some potential here too. Have you gotten any feedback from Google or any indication that they are eager to get more than just individuals but um, organizations to participate? I have not seen that. Um, the, the, the things that we are seeing as, as help out providers from Google is an interest in advertising, in getting your help out out there, getting it listed. Um, help out providers were sent uh, an email with 10 coupons uh, for $15, like $15 vouchers that you could give to different people so that it could encourage them to try out some of the paid help outs um, as well, so it's not all just the free ones. Um, I know that Google was advertising saying that they seem to feel that there's a need for help out providers to help um, new parents. Uh, I know there's a lot of lactation specialists that are on uh, help outs, but it seemed that they wanted something broader than just, than just lactation specialists. They wanted uh, people who could actually talk to new parents and help them through different issues. Uh, but those are the types of things. Their focus right now seems to be getting the message out, getting more people to consume the help out services. Well, that's really interesting that you said um, there was discussion about coupons because my head is going now with spinning with ideas of, well, it, could you reward patients that are active in their own health care, who are following all the directions properly, who have indicated that they're, they're proactive in their health and they're following the proper protocols that you can trust them to not come in for every little thing and trust that when they say they have certain symptoms, they have those symptoms, to give those people as a reward for, um, for being more accountable for their own care, those coupons to be able to get the help from home without even having to maybe pay for it. Right, so in other words, if they're going to be, it, from the medical side, we like to say that that is an engaged patient, that they are engaged in their health care. And as a thank you for your engagement, then here we will extend to you the, the opportunity to do a video help out instead of the inconvenience of taking off of work and driving halfway across town to see someone. And right. Yeah, that would be great. Well, I just want to welcome... Peter Kim, because he was able to finally join us. So, Peter, if you are na not able um, to to get your sound, can, can you say hello so we know if you've got yes, your sound on? I, just wanted, I wanted to say thank you very much. I mean, this has been very, very enlightening, you know, and I've had a lot of different thoughts because, you know, I just finished medical school and I'm looking for a residency right now. 
So um, I was just, it's amazing. You know, I really think that you can have patient-centered conversations. It can introduce a lot of efficiency. And like, you know, we've touched on a couple, you know, of y'all said, you know, it could speed things up. It could incentivize and engage the patients and save a lot of, both my parents are physicians, so I've seen a lot of, you know, waste and inefficiency in the emergency room. You know, there's just people that come in for routine stuff that if you could just talk to them and reassure them, and you don't need to give them a physical exam just to, if they can, you can talk to them, you can kind of dissuade them from clogging the system. So I think this is really great. You know, I, I just don't, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, just from this little limited interaction with the four of us, I really think that, you know, the potential is tremendous, you know, especially for organizations and stuff. The potential is also there in the bigger um, healthcare environment sense, meaning that if healthcare reform is truly going to get a larger base of people some sort of coverage, um, then there's going to be a need for primary care doctors to be able to get these folks into their offices. Uh, and if this is an efficient way of doing that, then then it, there's there's some some reason to lean on help outs as as a uh, tool to help. And I know Kathy will tell you that the primary care pool of physicians is pretty strapped right now. I'd be curious to hear how many providers in your area are taking new patients, because uh, I know in our area there's there's three or four in our healthcare system right now, which has over two dozen primary care offices. And um, so if we're going to get a whole new base of people who are covered and want to start to see a doc for some reason, then I'm going to have to start churning some people through. I'm going to have to start being open to new new uh, patients, and i got to do something to change my efficiency, which also, Kathy, Kathy Brown comes back to your idea about using this in the population health management sense of the word, meaning can my organization start to uh, schedule sessions with diabetic patients, for example, and just say, uh, did you get your eye exam? Uh, I'm going to send in a lab slip for you to get these, this blood work and a urine test done. Um, is there another way to really disrupts the, the usual point of care delivery of medicine so that you can use it in this population uh, as a population management. The, one of the barriers that we've seen with each one of these is that even though we talk about ACOs and we talk about performance and we talk about quality and we talk about population management is, is the way the IHI phrases it, uh, boy, is our documentation system not set up to handle stuff like this, and the current billing systems are not set up to handle stuff like this either. So uh, I would anticipate a very slow growth, um, especially when you start talking about people's pay and how insurances pay money out because no one's going to be too eager to embrace a, a new approach when it's so unknown. But yes, I think this is a great platform for it. I think there's this would be a great way to uh, to get in touch with people for for very pointed problems like that. Yeah, and I think that we're going to see as people start getting more interested in this. I think we're going to see a faster movement from ACOs because um, it's not so fee for service based. It's more of that population health as you're talking about. Right. Um, and Peter just came back in. Peter, did you? I know you you lost connection. And came back in. Did you have a question you wanted to ask, Brian? Oh, well, no, I just also wanted to say I speak a couple of languages, too. So, I mean, I speak Spanish and German and Korean. So, like, I know that sometimes it makes it really easy when I, am in the, on, when I was in medical school and I was doing my electives and doing my rotations and stuff because as I spoke Spanish, a lot of times other services would call me over to, you know, to translate and to help out with patients and stuff. And, you know, being able to speak, you know, and just bridge that, because this technology makes that possible, you know, instead of having to use the old phone or having to wait for somebody to translate, you know, it really makes it easier for the patients and, and it leverages technology to really help them, you know, so they feel a little bit better and they feel a little more empowered, you know. So I really I, think that's great, too. I hadn't even thought about the no. language issue, but that's an excellent point. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, they have, they have translators, but usually, you know, they're overworked and they're, they, they're only there during the day. They're usually not there on, in the evening. And then, you know, it's just one of those things. It's, it's a big problem because patients that don't speak a the language, they really do feel like, you know, they're, they're first, you know, the hospital 
hospital is an isolating place and it's an isolating experience, but then, you know, if you compound it with the language barrier, then they really, you know, they're just, you know, I've noticed with the Korean patients that when I talk to them, I mean, they just immediately are just like overjoyed to be able to talk to somebody that understands what they're saying, you know. But, yeah, my experience with that has been that people who do not speak the primary language in the area uh, actually feel like they get second-rate care. Yeah, and because uh, I've asked, I've asked people point blank. I said, "Do you feel that because you do not speak English that you're getting second-rate care?" And the answer has been yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 an unfortunate thing, but I think that this kind of technology, I mean, there's, you know, it's evolving, you know, but I think that it's this kind of thing is what medicine needs right now is we need to like kind of improve and kind of refocus on the patients and using technology to make things more efficient, you know, and make it more cuz you know there's so much inefficiency and overlap and and you know and assets and resources get wasted because there's not a kind of you know just cutting to the core and getting back to what's you know the most important thing which is the patient you know i mean there's a lot of stuff that i feel like you know going on rounds and stuff you see a lot of tests get ordered because of algorithms you know we get taught algorithms we don't get taught to think creatively we don't get taught to think of stuff we get taught to think of, you know, like back to the differential. We're told, think of the most common thing and, you know, don't hunt zebras, you know, just you got to, like, come up with the most common things. And sometimes that, that doesn't really work. You know, the algorithm logic sometimes doesn't work. You know, we get kind of, we, we, we think that it has to be one thing, you know, because that's kind of the other extreme from the patients coming in with a whole list of symptoms saying they've got one thing or whatever that they find on the Internet. But we also... In training, we get told, you know, think of the most common thing, and I don't know, it's just, it's interesting, you know. I mean, communication is the essence of medicine, so. I think we live in a very exciting time with technology and communication uh, merging into one, and the fact that we can tap into resources from around the world in a matter of seconds, and we can bring people to us in a matter of seconds, and we can see them and look in their eyes. Um, is really an, an amazing time to live and, and with all the other things that are happening with technology and healthcare and and the movement toward that is just really exciting to me. So we have we are running out of time for our hangout. We uh, normally end this at about 8.45 so we've already gone over a few minutes but it's just okay. been incredibly interesting to talk about. Um, so I'm going to wrap yeah. it up for tonight and okay. thank you Brian Pollock for sharing in your experiences and I hope you will stay um, in as an active part of our healthcare talk community so people can engage to. with you. Love to. Thank you for inviting me. And Kathy Nieder, thank you for joining us as a guest and asking some very good questions. I enjoyed it. It was nice to meet you, Brian. Nice to meet you, Kathy. And Peter, thank you for joining us, Peter Kim. And I hope that we will hear from Absolutely. Both. So this is uh, the end of our session on healthcare hangouts. Should physicians participate? Uh, my answer to that is yes, but you'll have to answer that question for yourself if you're watching this. And if any of you would like more information on how to navigate the help out sign up or hangouts in general, or you just want to become more familiar with the tools in Google Plus, I'm Kathy Brown with Brown Nose Social Media, and that's what I'm here for. So. This is uh, going to wrap it up for tonight. I hope you've all enjoyed, and I'll see you in Healthcare Talk. Okay, y'all have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.